Pharmaceutical Processing, in conjunction with Interfex 2017, presents Interfex Live. So, all right. So, to me, having been a pharmacist for more time than I don't want to admit, you know, pre-filled syringes have been around for a long time. So I think this is going to be something to bring it back in the reality here. Um, so just in general, what, what are we talking about here? What is a pre-filled syringe and why do people use them? Who wants to lead off? Dan, you want to start? Right ahead. Uh, sure. So a, a pre-filled syringe, essentially, uh, rather than, rather than uh, the, I guess, the older style of putting the product in a vial or an ampule, in the old days, the uh, product goes right into the syringe um, and delivered to the customer or the, the physician. Okay, I mean, so, some of the stuff we've seen, you know, if you remember in the ancient times, Wyeth used to, one of their big ones was Tubex. I'm sure some of you, nah, I don't think anybody's old enough for that. Anyway, there was a lot of pre-filled out there. So, what, you know, obviously they've been around, as you said, it's pretty straightforward. So what are the advantages to the marketplace? I mean, what is it, what advantage that they, they Right. Well, the, the, the biggest advantage for uh, for most people is actually uh, uh, creating a, a more user-friendly patient experience. So, uh, whether you uh, what are don't need to handle the product quite so much from a sterility perspective, that's obviously a, a big positive. Um, uh, it's also an improvement in sterility as far as a, a single-use type of uh, system. So, a lot of dosage forms have gone from multi-use vials and when I'm saying multi-use that would be say you have a 20 mil vial that you draw multiple doses of it and administer to multiple patients. So what could happen if you're doing a multi-dose type situation is that you could reuse that syringe from one patient to the next. Obviously that's poor uh, clinical practice but that's very discouraged but in some situations where you have financial pressures and, and things like that. Mistakes get made, uh, corners get cut. When you have a pre-filled syringe system, it's one dose uh, in one syringe and it is ready to go. So that's that's really the primary advantage uh, to it. Disadvantages, Dan? Is there any disadvantage? Um, so I guess uh, disadvantages, some of the things that we're aware of uh, on a, on, as far as disadvantages from the uh, from the, maybe the doctor's point of view, I know uh, cold storage. Uh, we're told that it takes a lot more space, takes up a lot more space to store a syringe in a cold environment that does, say, a 10 pack of uh, small vials. So that it's that those are the types of things, and the packaging tends to be a little bit bigger. Um, so if that's important, then that could well, be. I think a that's important. That's that's a piece of the supply chain people usually forget about. Right. So we we spend a lot of time trying to shrink our packaging down and, and do things so that it doesn't take up a lot of space. And you know, for us, it's we like it. We like the syringes because you don't have to put as much product in the container to compensate for the holdup volume that might be trapped in the vial because you got to count for what's in the vial, then what what's left over in the syringe. That's after you administer the dose. So. It's actually a little bit more efficient doing the syringe for us. I would think that in today's environment of cost effective and cost consciousness, yeah. I know, in, and especially in the administration, which says, as an industry, we get away with murder for what we charge. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, just so you know, I come at this as a uh, formulations guy. I mean, <coughs> to me, you know, solution chemistry is that, that's nirvana. I mean, it's, you know, once something goes into solution, I'm really off the hook. So we're going to focus on, and in, in my opinion, sterility, sterile syringes, uh, ser sterile facilities, clean, that stuff is a nightmare to me. I mean, you know, it's bad enough I get messed up with stuff I can see, it's the stuff I can't see when it gives me a problem. So we're going to focus a little bit more on the uh, equipment, the planning, and, the, and you know, selection. So having said I've made this formulation, what are the major components or parts? that I should be starting to look at and to, to, uh, to uh, source. Who wants to take a shot at it? Jared, you want to take a shot at that one? I guess. Um, yeah, so you have, uh, you, know, you have a liquid product. Obviously, you need the equipment to fill it into the syringe. Uh, I, I wish we had a, a tub and a, a nest here, uh, if you haven't seen it. But um, say a traditional vial line, you have a tray of vials, tray them on. They go through a washing machine, a depyrogenation tunnel, into a filler. It's more of a uh, you know a continuous process. Uh, 
pre-filled syringes or even pre-filled cartridges, pre-filled vials. Now, uh, you know, they come in this tub in a nest configuration, already sterile. So there's no washing, there's no sterilization. You cut the bag off and the bag go, or the tub goes into the machine. Um, so you're looking at completely different process from say vials. So, you know, the typical machines on a filling line, uh, a debagging machine, uh, you may have heard of an E-beam. Uh, some people use an E-beam. Uh, an E-beam does a outer surface sterilization. It is a, a sterilization process of the outside of the tub. Uh, you can do that or you can't. There are different opinions in the industry and different companies are doing different things. Um, and then you have a, a delitting machine and your filling machine. So it's, it's very different equipment. Um, and there are slower machines where that debagging process is a manual process, so no machine, or there's semi-automated machines. And the delitting process, similar. Uh, for higher speed lines, it's completely automated. There are some low speed uh, applications and clinical applications where it's done manually. Uh, the, the filling is pretty much you know, outside of very low speed uh, in, in early clinical filling is completely automated. Um, but okay, so thus, what type of uh, nested, yeah, we heard nested component, what, what kind of nested components are available and what are out there? What's a common set of sizes? What's, what's up with that? So there's uh, two main configurations for, uh, for syringes, uh, and they typically come in a 10 by 10 tub uh, nest configuration, or they can come in a 10 by 16 or 160 uh, syringes in, a, in an extra large tub. Uh, the dimension of that 10 by though is the important part. That therefore you can you can fill them in the machine at 10 of the time uh, in the in the same manner. So that's kind of one of the ways you scale up. Uh, the uh, syringes can also have a different length or depth. So they can be you know 10 mil long syringes. They can be 5 mil syringes. You can have different fill levels in larger syringes as well. Um, the next component that, that comes as part of it is a, uh, is a plunger. Okay? A lot of people think of it almost like a stopper. And the way that gets uh, put into the, uh, into the syringe is after you fill the syringe, you have to put the plunger in. Now, when you put the plunger in, you can't just stick it in the, machine, in the top of the uh, syringe and push on it, because if you did that, you would squirt all the product out the bottom. So uh, there's two main methods for doing that. One is using a vacuum to draw it in, okay, and get it, get it placed in the right level. And the other one is called an insertion tube. And you can think of that way where you kind of have a tube that comes down inside the vial and your, your plunger comes through that and then gets released and doesn't get in contact actually with the glass on the side of the vial until the end of the insertion tube. So those are the main components of, of a pre-filled syringe. I heard that. Uh, just on can, that. I, can I add one thing? Sure, go ahead, Joe. Uh, just to touch on that, so a lot of times these syringes too, you can get them either with the needle on the syringe, it's called a state uh, syringe, or you get it with the lower tip, um, and that, that's, that, that gives, the, gives the doctor some choices. Uh, you know, for instance, you get a syringe with a lower tip, it, it allows the doctor or the nurse to pick what needle is used. So imagine for a pediatric dose, you know, for an infant, you would use a, a smaller needle. For an adult, maybe you use a larger needle. It hurts a little bit more, um, but it, it, it gives the doctor a choice of what needle to use for uh, a patient or, or also what they're administering. How long does the needle need to be? You know, things like that. It gives you a choice of what to use. And how does that component get worked in then? If it's a more it's a lure tip, which means that the hypodermic is not in the in, not in the not in the process. Yeah, it's a separate pre-sterilized item, you know, that the, the hospital would have to source or the doctor would have to source. But then uh, it, it's it's another pre-sterilized component. So they would you. take the lure tip off, put the needle on, and do the injection. So Dan, is that something you had to supply with the medication, or if in this case, or is that something that your that your patients would go out and have to source on their own, not the patient? Typically, for us, typically the uh, the physician would have that needle there. We wouldn't normally supply that, um, and it also goes back like to one of the advantages of not having the needle there, because we used to we used to package with the needle attached, um, and it just shrinks the packaging that much further. So, 
Yeah, you know, uh, on this materials thing, Jared, what, I mean, I heard glass, I mean, so let's talk about materials. What, what, generally speaking, is it still all glass? Where are we at? Mostly glass, but I think uh, plastics and polymers are becoming, more, uh, you know, one, there's, there's more uh, manufacturers that offer it. I think in years past, it was pretty much all glass. Mm -hmm. um, but there's been, um, you know, a lot of things in the industry have come up about delamination and and the way you know, material handling of syringes is a lot different than vials. You can't put a syringe on a conveyor and, and just move it along. Um, so the way that you handle them is different. And a lot of uh, years and years ago, a lot of machines, the, the syringes would just bump into each other. And their you know concerns are you chipping off glass? What's the external appearance look like? Um, and then of course what's inside? Um, so polymers and, and plastics I think are starting to become a little bit more uh, widely used. You know, uh, in in the uh, in the clinical stages, a company might select a, a plastic or polymer syringe instead of glass might be a certain product reason or there's just some some other reason that they want to uh, but there's there's a lot more choices out there I think, I think you can get upwards of a 50 ml syringe you know in nests now um, and get them in plastics so there's the, the suppliers that make these components are starting to offer more and more things so of course the end users have a lot more choice of uh, what they can actually put them into so Les, let me ask you this I mean I'm hearing a couple of things that I heard Clinic. So, do you see this in early stage? Do people actually go down this road in an early stage development, or do they still go to the ampules or the vials? Or what? What's what? Where are we at now? So we're starting to see a lot of that now. Really? Um, yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Um, one of the uh, products that we work with a lot is a, is a small scale uh, filling system that's that's modular, so people can fill syringes on it, you can fill vials on it, you can do. Um, nesting configurations or regular uh, uh, bulk types, uh, either syringes or ty not, not typically bulk syringes, but bulk vials. And uh, we're finding that to be extremely popular for a couple different reasons. Uh, one, uh, from a, I'll call it big pharma perspective, or even people who want to get into aseptic processing. Typically, that would take a large investment. You have to build a lot of equipment and machinery, and you're talking you know, $25 million of just capital equipment getting into that business and, and maybe $100 plus million dollars to put the facility together. Um, with some of these lower cost modular systems that are in isolators and things, uh, you can get, just for capital equipment, you know, under $5 million, you can kind of get up and running into an aseptic uh, manufacturing operation. And that changes the dynamics of the make versus buy decisions on whether or not you're going to use a contract manufacturer or whether you want to do it in-house. A lot of people want to gain control of that in-house. Uh, on the opposite side of that, if you're a contract manufacturer out there um, and you want to specialize in this small scale, either clinical stuff or small batch, um, you're looking now to attract some of the big pharma people, uh, but you don't necessarily have the resources to spend that big money to build that facility, so now we're finding other people are, are getting into isolation technology and other more advanced technologies on a smaller scale, and we're able to offer it uh, in a very attractive way to uh, to the big pharma companies have that same level of quality. It's interesting because one of one of the things that we researched as part of the topics that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of days is enabling people to get into the industry. In other words, if you're a startup, if you're a one-off. In other words, instead of the, the hurdle being 30 million, it's 5 million. Instead of the hurdle being that you have to fill 200,000 square feet, you can put it in a module and stick, yeah, put it into a confined space. What I think, what I'm hearing is, and I think it, it, it feeds into the trend that we're hearing, is enablement, the small guy, I mean, it's innovation, that kind of stuff. On that note, though, Dan, would it, these, are these things customizable? I mean, we're off the, we're off the small scale. I mean, I'm hearing nesting tubs. I mean, you go as you know, as a as a as a user when you go to a supplier, these things customizable. Or, or I would not? I would say you could probably get any you know you could probably have some level of customization, but typically there's there's standard formats, and when you get into customization, I think the cost is probably 
very, very high. So um, I, I don't have experience requesting custom type gotcha. configurations. I think typically most, most companies go for uh, whatever existing format fits closest to their need. Um, I'm sure that the, you know, the, the folks that make the tubs would make anything you want if you had the money to invest in the dies and the formats, yeah. but then you get into unique equipment and I think the cost just gets spread all over the place because now you're not, you're not ordering that standard filling equipment anymore. Now it might be a little bit different, but if it's a smaller scale, it might be worth it. But if it's a large, high, high volume, you, you probably would go with something more off the shelf, I would yeah. imagine. Is that custom early, Joe? That's the way it goes? Yeah, pretty much. But uh, I have worked on one project where a, uh, a client of ours basically came up with their own kind of device and it, it, it went into a nest but they had years of development with a, a supplier uh, to even get it to the point where they they could package it to then you know if you, if you go buy a filling machine the first thing that they ask you for is well send me some components so we can start going testing well if you're developing the components you now can't order your equipment because you don't have anything to actually build, build, and you know, base the equipment build on. So it goes from a you know, a year or two cycle to five or ten. I mean, this this one client I worked with, they were years in development of this device. Um, you know, and something didn't work right, redesign, and you know, it just kind of churned. So um, you can get into, you know, as Dan said, you can get into the customization of it, but now all of a sudden your your product lead times go through the roof versus buying something off the shelf. That sounds to me like, uh, I don't know, I, I've been down that road or a few guys I see that in a lot of inhalation, the tail wags the dog. All of a sudden it's not about the drug product anymore, it's about the delivery device. Yeah, granted, it has to be delivered, but it can be delivered in a myriad of ways. You know what I mean? It sounds yeah. to me like they got hung up on that. Yeah. But while we're on the topic of devices, one of the things that I've always been fascinated about, because I had done, you know, some work in the past and as a, as a clinical pharmacist. One of the things was the powder liquid combinations. Now, we've seen all kinds of ideas out there. In fact, you remember there was a, uh, there was a couple where the powder was on the top of the vial, liquid was on the bottom, you squeeze the two together and they mix them and you snap them apart. Incredibly expensive, which I, I don't even think it's around anymore. So the old, Powders for resuspension or resolution. How do we deal with that on a pre-filled syringe? That kind of thing. Les, you want to take that? One? Sure. Um, yeah. So there are there is such a thing as a dual chamber syringe, and you can do exactly that, where you have a um, uh, you know the first uh, the liquid get get filled, and then you put one plunger in, and then you have a second uh, component, which is typically the powder, goes in. So now you have the diluent and the powder together. Um, and they can be mixed right at the uh, at the bedside there, and it's a very clever, very clever device. But they are quite expensive uh, and complex to handle as well. Um, the nice part about it is now you have a lyophilized product uh, that you don't need the cold chain uh, storage for. So that that's a major benefit. Uh, but again, you pay for that in your uh, more enhanced packaging and your. More expensive filling system. And I would then, think, yeah, controlling it, that stuff. And it gets into a much more complicated machine then, because yeah. now, you know, standard machine does filling and plungering. Now you need a machine that does filling, plungering, and plungering. Right. Now that machine grows, gets more complicated, more components into it, and yeah, the thing I see is it's powder filling, liquid filling, two times plungering. Yeah. Right? yeah. To me, yeah, you know, it, it seems. You know, I think one of the things. Before we get off, because that brings to mind, you know, when I'm making this, where am I going to make it? Before I get into that, it was, so, you know, how has the new technology, before we move on and talk about facilities, but how has the new technology really changed syringe, you know, changed the sterile filling methods now? I mean, what's your perspective on it? You know, in other words, looking back, here's where we're at, where we've been, what's, what's your, what's your take on it? Uh, so for, from my perspective, the, the, the most recent changes that I've dealt with um, from old to new is, is, you know, you get into the check weighing, 
Um, so you get a close to 100% check weigh in your products. Um, other things like uh, uh, disposable uh, product path and the whole, the whole fill, you can get a whole filling system that's disposable now. Uh, that's not specific to syringes, but it could be uh, vials, whatever. But that to me is, is, is pretty novel because you don't have to invest a lot of validation effort and utility expense trying to clean the, the fixed piping and sterilize things. Um, you have, you basically would just have a system where you would, when you would set it up in the beginning, it comes pre-sterilized and cleaned. And then when you're done filling, you can just, you know, toss it. You're, of course, you're adding things to the waste stream, but um, from a simplicity point of view, from an operations perspective, that that's, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, we're looking at. Okay. I think what we need to do too is you know, one of the, one of the problems I think in a lot of cases is not a problem, but I think we forget that there's the equipment, there's the drug, there's the solution, there's the device, but there's the, where do I make it part? Okay, and I think in our, and what it's the, this discussion here, the where do I make or where do I make it part, has a significant impact on ownership. So how do I choose or decide this? You know, as isolated as rabs, as filling. So. Who wants to take a shot at Jerry? You want? Where do I look? Where do I start? Can you ask that again? Okay. <laughs> right. Let I me put it to you this way. Wasn't so clear. Right. Wasn't? My God. <laughs> Sorry. No. Dude. In other words, in other words, you you have to fill and make stuff, right? Yeah. And it has to be either in an isolator, clean room, whatever, wraps, whatever. What guidance do we give our clients? Oh, okay. Where do you start? Okay. okay. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Good. Um, Man. So, you got me. <laughs> I, I want to ask some questions too, you know. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, so for, for, from my perspective, uh, isolators are the way to go. Um, it, it allows you to build a, a smaller facility, which, you know, smaller is cheaper. Uh, there's always a thing, uh, there's been a stigma in our industry, I think, that, uh, you know, isolators cost more money and, and things like that. The, the isolator itself costs more money, but when you look at the complete facility, um, they're cheaper facilities to build, and they're cheaper facilities to operate. Uh, you know, gowning costs go down significantly. Your your energy costs go down significantly. There's there's so many advantages to it. Um, you know, you know, from my my perspective, from our company's perspective, you know, we're we're very pro isolator, and we and we push that. There's also a number of regulatory reasons why isolators are better. You know, and, and uh, the FDA will physically come out and tell you isolators are better. We would love to see you make your products in isolators. It doesn't mean you can't do it with RABS. Um, there's hundreds or thousands of RABS lines out there. People still buy new RABS lines. Um, I work on projects with RABS lines. Um, it, you know, in, in the end, it is what, what the company feels comfortable with. What is their existing technology? Do they want to take on that, that burden of maybe moving from a conventional or a RABS to an isolator? It's not easy. If it was easy, everybody could do it. Um, so, you know, uh, it, 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 it's not something that you just say, I want to do this and poof, it happens. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of thought that has to go into it. I think, I think the, uh, yeah. just, to, just sorry, to comment on that, I'm sorry, the, uh, and don't underestimate the cost of maintaining all that high quality airspace, the grade B area mostly. So, you know, you shrink that down dramatically with an isolator. And I can say from an op operations point of view, you know, we have a lot of real estate that's under grade, you know, A and B designation. And when you look at process improvements and deviations and issues, a lot of it can be attributed to your environmental monitoring. That's a lot of data, that's a lot of QC work. I mean, it just adds up and grows and grows and grows. So there's a lot of support systems around that to have all of that real estate under a high quality air. So when you shrink that down, um, it shrinks all those costs down so that, you know, you put the cost in the, in the equipment up front and then you can kind of eliminate all that environmental monitoring, you know, afterwards. And, and everything else that goes along with it. So yep. Les, we, you know, sometimes we got to smack the guys in the head back and develop and make sure he's got the right land. So I think we got to even step back further. So what's, what are some of the key points that we have to understand before I even start planning prefill? I mean, okay. I kind of jumped ahead there because I was, yeah, you know, kind of linear thinking. But I think if we step back and say, okay, real estate triggered the thought. So what's the first thing we got to do? So, um, 
you know, if, you, if you're looking at, at space planning, um, you, know, you obviously need to make layout decisions based on also your process equipment. So I'm a big proponent of process first, and then the facility should di be dictated from your process. Um, some of the key things I see missing a lot of times when I see process layouts is looking at um, the process as a static thing rather than looking at it as a flow. Uh, for example, having just staging areas on the, on the front end and the back end for, for finished product and work in process. Um, looking at your airwalk flow and, and being able to bring components in without hiccuping at all during your, uh, during your startup process and being able to move stuff out of there um, in, in good process component flow. So that's on the macro side. Um, on the you know on the smaller side as far as individual processes you know your level of automation and sophistication in a lot of your solutions really dictates um, your ultimate quality capabilities um, you know does automation and um, isolation technology equal quality uh, some people can debate that but I think it's kind of been debated and I wouldn't say more is always better, but typically the, the higher quality systems, uh, the fewer deviations you're going to have is if you, say, choose an isolation system. And then you go and you look at how do you bring things in and out of an isolator. So looking at the syringe tubs in the beginning, you have something that's typically either single or double bag. So some way you need to remove those bags. And then once those bags are removed, is that your ultimate transfer step to get it into the isolator? Or do you have some sort of validated sterilization process like an e-beam, which does that surface treatment on the outside of the tubs? Um, again, you're adding another layer of sophistication, another layer of cost. But if you look at it at the higher scales, once you're filling you know, 400 a minute or more, um, you can eliminate maybe one of your overwrap bags. And just that extra, Two dollars or whatever you save uh, per bag. If you're looking at, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of units per year uh, of these tubs going through at 600 a minute, you'll be amazed how quickly you pay for an EV uh, piece of equipment. Um, when you look at the smaller scale, it's not as financially justified to do that. And what we what we found, we actually did a recent survey and scan trying to understand, you know, what is really um, driving this? Is it quality driving it, or is it uh, automation driving it and the financial piece? And our answer was, it's, I'll call it ironic, that um, the financial decision seems to match the, uh, uh, <laughs> the operations. So the higher speed lines, we find 70 to 80% of those use EVs. And um, on the lower speed lines, uh, where an e-beam would be very difficult to financially justify, uh, we find that they're not there. Um, so, kind of the answer answer ends up being obvious. But someone might say, well, just because of smaller scales and lower GMP, and you know, it's a it's a tough argument uh, to de to defend. The good news is that with even you know a, a well conceived debagging system with some level of automation can do a great job from a quality perspective and it's not just opinion it is there have been millions and millions of units passed through these systems and uh, and they generally have excellent quality profiles as far as the sterility of the tub the sterility of the end product so yes there is a continuum of quality but fortunately we're talking about a continuum of quality of excellent versus great um, versus adequate and inadequate. So it's, it sounds to me like there's a couple of things going on here, so let me break them down. So first off, from a reality standpoint, e-beam is something that is customary, something that you have in place? Uh, we don't have an e-beam on our site, but I know other other uh, shops in our uh, in our Santa Fe network have them. Understood. Yeah. And while we're on this, again, I, want, I don't want to lose track of that low 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 volume small are there you know are there filling lines for pre-fill that do large scale high volume and then 
Always, you know what I'm saying? I mean, in other words, if you wanted to make pre-filled syringes, are you know, are you looking at a high volume, high output? I mean, is these things tunable? I mean, what's yeah. what's you know you know where I'm asking? I mean, yeah. bottom line. So you want let, Les, do you take a shot then, Jared? Jared, Jared you go ahead. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's just like out of any any filling machine. You you have a maximum speed of the line, and you can run it slower if you want. So you can take. Uh, there are syringe machines that will actually do close to a thousand per minute. Uh, Les mentioned earlier a, a 10 by 16 nest. You can actually these machines have 16 fill needles on them, so you're filling 16 at a time, and it, it hits up to 960 per minute. You can take that and slow that line way, way down and fill 50 a minute if you wanted to. But then you have this big line, a more expensive line. Um, typically more line losses. Imagine filling through 16 needles at the end of a fill, you're gonna lose more liquid. Um, you might have more rejects, things things like that. It's, it's things to, to consider. On a slower line, um, you can run one fill needle. So it, it, it gets to be what, what's your batch size, what's the value of your product, how many, how many do I wanna uh, waste? Um, one, one thing that's a challenge, especially talking expensive products, um, you know, on a, on a vial machine, you have the ability to reject a single vial. So if you have one bad one, say with a missing stopper, you can reject that. Syringes gets a little more challenging because imagine having this tub and nest with either 100 or 160 units in it. If one of them is bad, how do you know which one? and how do you get that out of the nest? Uh, the equipment manufacturers are starting to do a little bit more there to be able to remove a single vial, but lines from even a couple years ago just couldn't do that. So typically what you do, that whole nest gets thrown away. So you got one bad one, you throw 100 away. Um, so I, I think, I don't see many expensive products run in pre-filled syringes. You know, a flu vaccine, Sanofi, I, I used to work at Novartis. Uh, so, you know, flu vaccine isn't a super expensive product, so if you throw a few away, uh, you're making millions of them, so if you throw a few away, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but for high dollar products, you know, there, there are products that are ten or $15,000 a dose now. Um, to put those in this nest might not be the, the smartest thing to do. Um, and I, I know when I worked in Novartis, we had the challenge of if there's a missing plunger, you just let a person remove it after it comes out of the machine. Operation says yes, quality says no, we're not touching it. You know, we tray stuff on at the beginning and it comes out in a cardboard box at the end and humans aren't touching it. Um, that gets to be a, uh, an interesting discussion between operations and quality and you know, me as an engineer saying, hey, you can do whatever you want. Um, well, being in the board is gradual myself. So, actually, um, what I, I guess the point that I, one of the other things that I want to touch on, it seems that this whole aspect of single-use, disposable, and, I mean, where does that come into play here? I mean, when we're talking about pre-fill syringes, is, are these, you know, what is, what are, what, what, are the, what are the pluses and minuses, or is it customarily used? Dan, you want to take a, take a um, first so shot there? single use in terms of uh, the, 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 the disposable filling lines we're that's something that we've looked at in the past and uh, you know we, we might look at something like that implementing something like that in the future um, like I, I think I mentioned it before there's a lot of advantages to not having to worry about uh, you know a CIP cycle an SIP cycle there's a I could talk all day about how many challenges there are with those systems and what kind of uh, you know, deviations might occur and it slows down your process time. And, and it would be really nice to just at the end of the fill, just get rid of what you're, you know, the, get all the juice out you need to get out and then get rid of it. And then you can, your turnaround time between batches becomes very short. What typically you know, you, is that? So you could, it, it could be as long as, you know, 12, 15 hours in between batches if you get to process all these, uh, uh, you know, you get all your cleaning for the parts that are off the machine, plus your cleaning uh, on the machine. And then if you have a, a problem with one of your cycles, then you, now you're back repeating things. Uh, I think 
having a disposable uh, dosing uh, part of your system would be uh, something yeah. very very key to look at. I think it just it just eliminates a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of time out of your process. It, it, there's other there's other challenges that go along with that, but yeah. the uh, time wise, I think it just cuts a lot of time out. Is there up, there's other upstream stuff that's once that's a single use. Too. Yeah. Yep. So less. I mean, that's one. I know you had mentioned that on the disposable side. I mean, you obviously, where, where is that? So we have. So uh, the the main big bang that you get for your buck is really in the product pathway. Um, and, and Dan definitely did, did a nice job hitting, hitting all those points because uh, if you can have a good turnaround time, because a lot of people worry about isolator turnaround time because the, there's a hydroperoxide gassing cycle that takes a while. Well, those cycle times have gotten dramatically better. Uh, it's not uncommon to have an under two hour cycle time or even less uh, for a lot of isolators now. So now your critical turnaround time ends up being the turnover of the line. You gotta do the line clearance. You have to, if you're doing change parts and um, change you to a new line configuration, uh, a new dose, new filling needles, things like that. If you can have that all pre-set up in a pre-sterilized, ready to go system, then you can be highly efficient in your turnaround and then get up and going again. If you're in small scale processing, maybe that's not your, your uh, uh, biggest, biggest point and you're uh, and you're most interested in uh, things like you know getting the last drop of product out there um, and having said single filling needles something like that so you can use these technologies or you can um, you, you use simpler solutions uh, to, to get you to those points yeah I, I think this oh, good. Go ahead. I think the the thing to remember though if if you have it if you're putting in a, a fully disposable uh, you know, product path. You have to you, you have to consider extractable leachables. You know, your product interaction. You have to um, really focus on designing that system really well with with whatever vendor or vendors that are putting that together for you. Because um, you can run into things like you know, if, if there's connectors aren't right for your application or uh, whoever this, you don't have a good control of the supply chain of where all that stuff comes from and the quality of that. You can ro really run into a lot of issues. Yeah, and something I'll throw on that, yeah, with with uh, disposable technology, you're relying on a supplier. And with pre-filled syringes, you're relying on a supplier to deliver you sterile goods. Um, you're putting a lot of onus on on a supplier, a lot of trust. So now you're, regular, you're doing regular quality <coughs> audits of all of these suppliers, you know, versus just getting raw, dirty glass from a supplier, then you do the washing, you do the sterilization and things like that, you're, you're relying on suppliers a lot. Um, I think one other, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I do that all the time, it comes to yeah. page. Um, oh, uh, with uh, you know, the nested syringes and disposable uh, fluid path does tie together uh, in, in one sense too. With a pre-filled syringe line, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, you don't have a washer or a tunnel. Um, so you don't have to bring WFI into a washing machine, let's say. And when you get into a, a disposable fluid path, you don't have to run a CIP, you don't have to run an SIP. So there are now filling lines that have no, other than maybe air or nitrogen, there's no clean utilities coming to that entire line. So your WFI usage goes down, your clean steam usage goes down. Uh, the size of your WFI tank goes down, and all of the energy around making all of that WFI. All the, te the testing, the QC, all, all, all that stuff. All the lab it's testing and everything. And, um, and you know, CIP, SIP cycles, it's four to five hours to, to run those. That's four to five hours that you can't run your line versus a disposable fluid path. Take it out, put the new one in. It's not doesn't happen in five minutes, but yeah. but you can get up and running a lot. A lot faster and plus the validation of those systems and the constant revalidation and if yep. you change it then you get a more validation it just goes okay, on and so on we could, just to bring it full circle here we talk about large scale small scale isolators rabs disposable the fact that you're pretty much married to your suppliers um, brings me to and to wrap this up brings me to my favorite topic operational problems so you've decided that this is the way to go so Dan, what's uh, what's your pet peeve on an operational problem? 
Um, I would say, you know, having a really good relationship with the uh, whoever's supplying your components and making sure you have the specifications appropriate and with the right amount of controls because uh, what often happens is that there will be some variation that maybe wasn't accounted for when you had the machine built and you gave the machine manufacturer a couple lots of tubs to play with. Um, over time, things change and maybe you know, there might be that, that variation that you didn't account for now suddenly has a big impact on, on your, uh, your daily operation. And, and this may not be a big deal when you have a small output line, but when, you're, you know, when you have batch sizes of three quarters of a million doses and you're, you're running 24 seven, it could be a big, big problem. So I think, you know, getting a handle on that and, and having vendor relationships that, you know, you want the vendor that'll come in and work with you and help solve the problems and also the machine manufacturer because it's not always the vendor's problem. Um, sometimes there's something with the machine that's not quite right and, mm -hmm. and that has to be adjusted and, and you, you really have to have rela good relationships with everybody that you're dealing with so that they want to work with you and, and uh, not just point fingers but to help fix the problem. So Les, it sounds to me like it's a nuts and bolts usually that the operational <coughs> problems. It doesn't sound like it's a clinical problem <coughs> so you don't be calling the development sounds to me like you call it packaging guys uh, so uh, yeah I'll, I'll jump I'll jump topics on you a little bit here because uh, I see you know, you know clinical is a, a whole other thing yeah one of the things that's really important in clinical obviously is cho once you choose your um, your bio or your syringe or your particular packaging your primary packaging of your product that's part of your submission right so you're you're tied to that for the lifestyle life uh, cycle of the product. Indeed, um, yes. So that's that's a really really important decision. Um, one thing operationally, I'd like to, to throw on um, uh, to kind of extend from from Dan's view. Uh, one of the things that that my company has done a lot of is is Rabs retrofits, where uh, they've taken a uh, a conventional line and they put a restricted access barrier around it, and. Uh, from an operational perspective on the machine operation itself, um, I'll say, you know, technically that's not a change to the machine, but a well done RAPS retrofit actually takes the process into consideration and hopefully you're making process and equipment improvements at the same time. Um, the interesting thing about that is, you know, I, I talk to, you know, you go back after doing it a couple of years later and you talk to the manufacturing folks and um, they'll say, you know, our, uh, our operational efficiencies, our OEE levels are down one or two percent from where they were before because we're um, you know, just not able to run as fast because we have all these restrictions now on being able to get into the line and we can't just open the door and dump the components in. Now we have to have a, a component entry system that is, that is structured and keeps the people out of the process and all that type of stuff. And um, so they're kind of like, yeah, yeah, that was pretty good. And then I walk to the next cubicle and I talk to the quality person and they're like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing we ever did because now I'm not doing investigations. And yes, they're losing one or 2% uh, operational efficiency while they're working. But if the line's down for three months because I'm doing investigations on contamination events, which I'm not doing anymore, uh, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. So. You know that you kind of have to look at these quality versus uh, you know operational decisions in a, in a bigger context too. Gentlemen, thank you very much. That brings us to a close Thanks, of this session. Thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you. Pharmaceutical processing, in conjunction with Interfex 2017, presents Interfex Live.